We, I, I know that uh, the, um, the RSVP list that we were looking at this morning had uh, confirmations from outside India as well. Uh, I know Lalit has a, a very nice fan following. Uh, so just curious, uh, what countries are uh, represented uh, on the call today? Part from India. So this is Kevin Baum. I'm sitting in Melbourne, Australia, if you can hear me. Yes, Kevin, we can hear you. Welcome, welcome, and thank you for, for participating. My pleasure. Hello, this is Valmika Nathan, Bangalore. Sorry, Go ahead. Sorry I, did I interrupt somebody? No, I, I you think, go first. Yeah. Now, this is Valmika Nathan. Bangalore. And Kajal, where, where are you uh, based? I'm in Singapore. All right. This is Samita, Bangalore. Hi, Samita. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Nimisha, Mumbai. Nimisha, hi. Hi. again, Mumbai. We have a good uh, representation from Mumbai. Hi, this, this is Kareen. Sorry. Sorry, this is Kareen. Um, I'm from Singapore. I guess the, the, uh, the folks from Delhi are probably pro preoccupied with the, the goings on at the, uh, the political stage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, could be is Dinesh here. Uh, my name on the screen is Indian Maze. Ah. And I'm in Gurgaon. You are in Gurgaon. <laughs> Good. We have somebody from NCR. Okay. So, uh, shall we uh, then begin? It's already 11:36. Uh, 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 to give respect to the time that we have star given out, and we also would like to make sure that we end on time. So uh, I will get started. Uh, Lalit, uh, should we, uh, should I start with the introduction? Yes, please. Uh, you can start. Uh, uh, my name is Suresh Raina. I'm um, a part of the team at Hunt Partners. Um, and uh, we have this platform uh, that we have named Coach Compass. Uh, it's about a year old and uh, uh, through the uh, good offices of Coach Compass, we have been organizing these webinars over the last uh, now uh, six odd months. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce the speaker today, Lalit Jaktiani, who has very kindly agreed to make time to share uh, his thoughts uh, that he weaves around business transformation and uh, digital strategy. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's an area which is of special interest for me. Uh, and uh, I, I will be uh, probably finding it difficult to pay attention to the uh, Zoom control <laughs> board. That's why I've asked Amita to help me. Uh, Lalit has led and managed transformations for customers uh, across APAC at SAP. That's where he's working currently. Uh, Lalit also is the co-founder of Lead Think, a platform for leaders and professionals to showcase their capabilities through personal insights and sharing of experiences in driving successful transformation in their organization. Uh, in his uh, tenure at SAP, uh, he has worked with clients, organizations through business transformation. And uh, passing on this mantra to lead effective change has become a mission for Lalit. Uh, and also, I am uh, also pleased to share that Lalit has authored uh, a self-published uh, book. Uh, I 
I know there is there are platforms available, but uh, uh, I haven't met too many authors who have done the uh, the self publication. So I would be very keen to hear uh, how challenging or how easy it is. But uh, this book, which is titled "When Change Happens." Uh, a story of organizational transformation. It aids the reader uh, with the daunting task of mastering techniques uh, to drive change. It talks about drivers of change in organizations, uh, either when they are aiming to grow, uh, when there is a lot of work required to inspire people, uh, or there is a change in the culture, uh, and many other aspects of change. So very happy to uh, have Lalit uh, here with us uh, for the session today. Uh, before I hand over to Lalit, I also wanted to take another minute to share with uh, the uh, this very nice group of participants who have uh, made time from their busy schedule uh, to attend this uh, seminar, uh, and that is to uh, talk to you and uh, introduce to you the uh, one year program that coach compass is going to be launching in a few months time called the leadership accelerator and uh, the the way uh, this webinar has come about is that uh, this leadership accelerator program has uh, different um, modules uh, different interventions, and Lalit is one of the faculty uh, amongst a few others who will be taking the participants through this journey of leadership um, during the course of the program. And that's why uh, it was it was very important for us to uh, to have Lalit uh, start becoming a part of Coach Compass, and we thought the best way would be this webinar. Uh, the this leadership accelerator is a one year program uh, to create an impactful and inclusive leader uh, it's uh, the design includes facilitated sessions uh, personalized personalized coaching webinars uh, it touches the heart of leadership uh, by bringing in the best of international faculty and thought leaders it is an inside out approach to leadership impact uh, the the program uh, is uh, taking a lot of input from a research study that uh, we had done in 2018 and 19 along with center of uh, center for creative leadership uh, that was based on the conversations with indian cxos and uh, the findings thereof and uh, we will be kicking off this program in may 2020 and it will run till Feb, March of 2021. And we are looking at a cohort of about 25 participants uh, who are on their CXO journey. That's a bit about Leadership Accelerator. Um, and now, without much ado, I will hand it over to Lalit to uh, start the session today. Lalit, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. All right, super. So let me get started. So the question and the heading of my topic is um, leading through change. Now, why am I kind of um, put these uh, in, in the header of my slide is essentially because today uh, change is not some, in at least the generation that I came from, change used to be something that you kind of planned and you thought about and then you had a strategy and based on that strategy, you created an execution of that and then managed all the people processes with that particular change. So it was kind of, you know, something that you bought about as a need or an outcome of a plan. But in today's context, if we kind of look at change, um, it's, it's very different. It, um, it, it is something that is kind of imposed on us by a very new animal called the digital economy. There's a lot of hype on it. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on digital economy. We all know what it is. But what's happening, and we all know that these new uh, startups and new entrepreneurs are coming and challenging the traditional way by which we do business. 
and because of that it's impacting the bottom line of many organizations it's penetrating their market share it's therefore impacting individuals like you and me in terms of jobs and it's also impacting organizations in the way we react to it including the organization that i currently work with we realize that a lot of new disruptors and therefore today it's not really a journey about hey let us plan a change management intervention but it's about how do you then manage these rapid changes and be as a as a part of the organizations or teams that we are in how do we then lead ourselves through that process so that we don't become at any given point of time victims of that particular change but thrive and survive in what we call this new paradigm so in this uh, session, what we're kind of looking at, and these are some thoughts, so they are not cast in stone and these are the best things to be done. So when you go home and say, hey man, this is really the best uh, strategy that I can adopt. They're more my thoughts, my experiences that I have um, come across. And it'll be great if you have a different set of experiences, we can discuss that and we can share it as well, um, even if it's after this seminar. So it's more about sharing our thinking around what are some structures that we need to examine and do we need to change, for example, any of these structures in our organization to deal with this new phenomena and make our organizations more rapidly evolving towards the change? Or do we create some new processes in the organization that will allow us to become more agile or more importantly as leaders, what's your and my role in making these organizations and the teams we work with more agile and responsive. So these are some of the topics we are going to talk about today. Um, obviously it's not going to be an exhaustive session, but some initial thoughts, and then maybe we can explore it as we go along uh, further. So uh, I'll, I'll kind of uh, share with you this picture and uh, maybe have a few responses from you. What do you think is happening in this picture? Any thoughts uh, from like any one or two of you to that sorting of the mail? Okay, I sorting of the mail is one. Anything else? Uh, the counting. Counting lottery tickets. Ah, wonderful. counting money. Yeah, I thought they're counting notes. <laughs> Okay, so great. So thanks for all those responses. I'm sure many, many more will have many more ideas, but for the interest of time, um, what I wanted to demonstrate is this whole concept of what we call our intelligence or insights on our That is, um, um, let me just check. Am I muted as well? No, no, we can hear you. No, okay. Okay, so so it's something that has um, kind of been there for many, many, many years. So what these girls are actually doing is they are looking at stubbles of train tickets. And looking at these stubbles of train tickets, they're trying to come up with some ideas for a railway organ, uh, company as to where typically are the passengers traveling, what are the typical routes they are taking, uh, what's the passenger load per station and things like that. So what we are talking about as uh, intelligence in the new era is something that's been happening over the past. But what we are also saying is that in the new world of digital, this particular team of smart young uh, people is no longer now needed and that's what's being replaced by machines. So what we are saying it typically is that the intelligent era, while we are saying it's evolving, it's evolving from a technology point of view. From a people point of view, intelligence and organizations have always sought to get customer insights on their products. It's not a new thing. So um, what, what, what is the insight we're trying to draw here and what is it that we're trying to conclude? What we are saying is that with this rapid uh, evolution of all these different technologies moving from the mainframe right up to what we now call the intelligent technology. There are some underlying ways by which uh, organizations are actually disrupting or startups actually disrupting uh, structured organizations. And therefore, a whole lot of new business models are evolving that are actually challenging the survival of organizations. So what you cannot see in that little box, there are something like 54 new business models that we have analyzed along with the University of St. Gallen um, that have kind of actually created in their time disruptions and are now being kind of repeated uh, with the aid of new technologies to create uh, challenging new ideas and, and challenging new ins, uh, customer services 
that uh, typically is uh, taking away or changing the way we are currently doing business. So what are some of these models essentially? First one, some of them are creating new data insights. So data has now become a currency for uh, get, gaining insights and then selling it as a piece of knowledge that never existed in the past. Our organizations normally kept those insights to themselves and there was no value seen other than those people within that organization. The shift has also come where rather than just providing products as we all know and, um, and, and as we all know that services are also about, it's about improving the way we engage our relationship or build a relationship with our customer and more importantly in the past when we worked in organization um, design and organizations we were fairly insular with a bunch of suppliers that we delivered a certain set of products and services but now it's more about creating symbiotic models of organizations where you know my organization and your organization symbiotically integrate with each other creating a value offering that is even more powerful than our individual organizations combined and technology is allowing us to do that so what this is actually saying is that it kind of makes us you me and all of us in the room and um, are part of a, who are part of an organization to rethink uh, the way we are running businesses so that is one and more importantly, as we move into this whole intelligent era, it's not only about organizations, it's you, me, and the task that we all do is also getting slowly challenged in terms of the fact that, hey, this task that you thought you were really good at doing, that, uh, the example we showed about the, uh, the, the employees counting, uh, analyzing the tickets, is no longer now uh, needed anymore because there are machines that can perform the task far better and far more intelligent than you do. So um, as we saw, automation initially took over some very physical tasks and then automation came into the era of taking over repetitive tasks, which were typically done, for example, at the, by the back end the part of an organization. And now this technology is moving into even taking over some of the more intelligent tasks of interacting with customers, engaging customers in conversations, in fact, doing assessments of uh, employees uh, to de de determine their competency. So there are many such things that traditionally we thought would not be replaced by machines are getting replaced by machines. So that's great. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is not new. I'm sure you've heard it enough times and you watched it on YouTube and you've also read it in many of the books. The question in the context of our conversation here is, what is it that we as uh, need to start looking at and what are some structures, processes that we need to relook at and re-examine within the way our, we are running our business that will prepare us for this change and will enable us to manage this entire rapidly changing uh, landscape and become su uh, successful and uh, survive in the future. So that's the context of what we're trying to address uh, in this particular talk. Um, so what we will do is we will be examining this from three different perspectives. The first perspective would be looking at it from structures. So the question here is, what are some of the structures in an organization that we may need to change or need to relook at if we want to become more agile, more responsive and, and become more uh, relevant in the context of the new world and the new customer expectation? Mm -hmm. Then we will look at, so what are some typical processes maybe that will allow us to rapidly bring in all these new innovations into our organization? and seed them in rather quickly. And then finally, we look at it from a people perspective to say, okay, if we have brought in all these new innovations in the organizations, how do we scale these innovations in a way that embeds itself as a part of our current organization so that we are able to then um, rebuild the future um, in, in a way that has actually taken that in, uh, innovation and, and driven it forward. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of pause for a minute. Are there any uh, questions at this moment or should I move ahead? Uh, I can hear some music in the background. <laughs> Okay, so but imagine that's the question. So for the music, I have no answer, but maybe I can proceed and maybe if there are any questions, please feel free to raise your hand and, and stop me on the flow. I'll continue till somebody decides to ask a question. Maybe that would be a better way of managing this. So I, I'm going ahead. Um, uh, can you hear me okay? 
Yes, yes, we can hear you. All right, super. So, so I want to kind of do away a bit with the theory. Mentioning these three are very critical. So I'll give you an example. We were working with a um, company in uh, Korea and they are into making uh, beauty products. And one of the things that they were doing is they were making beauty products for women above the age of 24. Uh, the underlying assumption was that um, they were into a more high end kind of product. And for them uh, in, in that particular part of the world, uh, women above 24 were more financially independent. They went into work, they could earn their own money and therefore could afford some of the beauty products that they had. Then they started realizing a very interesting thing. A new disruptor came in with really cheap uh, cosmetics and new cheap beauty products and they targeted the 16 year old. And uh, when they started selling to the 16 year old, um, uh, one of the underlying assumptions, obviously uh, this organization that I was working with uh, didn't uh, hold good was that a 16 year old ultimately became 24. And if she was um, very happy or satisfied with her look and the feel of that particular product that she was using, tended to continue uh, with that product. So the customer grew and as the customer grew older, they grew along with that product and they remained loyal to that product, which impacted almost 20% market share of this organization. So they realized that their business model was fundamentally flawed in this space. So the question then came as to, so how do we respond to that? Because if you think of it from a structural perspective, they will have to now relook at their entire manufacturing cost and manufacturing processes. They may need to re outsource some of their suppliers to be able to manage their pricing point. They will have to create a new marketing campaign to target this segment of customers because those of us who are in marketing know that a 16 year old has a very fundamentally different way of engaging in the media than um, a 24 year old. So they had, for example, these cosmetic shops where people could come in and try the cosmetic and uh, see how they look. And to move, to move away where you look at a 16 year old who are looking at a more virtual experience to say, hey, you know, can I um, kind of, uh, you had this um, app that actually allowed people to take selfies with the cosmetic and it also recommended based on your face type and color, what would be a, a, a beautiful, um, uh, um, color to use on your uh, and apply on yourself and you could even share that among your friends so a whole new strategy a whole new interaction a whole new structure a whole new process that was not not something that this organization was familiar with so that's why i think these three dimensions that i'm talking about are important so let's now move into the structure perspective and say okay as an organization now we are seeing this kind of a disruption happening what are some of the structures that we need to look at in the context of uh, responding to this kind of transformation. So one of the key drivers, of course, as we, you and I all know, that structure doesn't guarantee success. So when we are saying changing your structure doesn't necessarily mean that by changing the structure, you're going to guarantee to succeed in the new market. But of course, if you don't get the structure right, there's a very high probability that you would fail. Um, so let's kind of look at the traditional structures um, that exist. And uh, we all are familiar with the hierarchical model uh, where we have a series of reporting lines uh, that are fairly structured and kind of a command and control structure. This structure has worked very well over many, many years because the whole of business, I would argue, has kind of grown based on this over the past few years. Because And because of that, organizations were, be, were able to create a fairly predictable set of outcomes and, and products and services um, because it allowed for a very clear priority setting. It allowed for more optimization, that is minimizing of duplicate work. But the underlying flaw, if we kind of look at it in today's world, is this kind of a organization is very slow in adjusting to any drastic changes. Um, the whole difference between, you know, you have to depend on the formal position to take a decision who may not necessarily be the person on the ground understanding what's happening in the, in the market. And therefore, when by the time the chain of command gets activated to that kind of feedback, uh, it's almost always too late. So um, therefore, there's a challenge, uh, challenge of that. And plus, uh, because people are in departments, there's a kind of a prone to siloed thinking. So organizations over time, then they responded to that and they created this kind of heterarchy model, right? Where we have now multiple reporting relationships, multiple lines of power. You're struggling 
as employees to know who is the right boss that you need to work with. Um, it, it did allow for a lot of flexibility. It did allow for teams to work across and, and take away some of the silos. But um, of course, in you and I know who have been experienced in organization that it's a complicated model for individuals who are working there as well as for organizations. There is a lot of fluid governance and this can sometimes lead to political uh, politicking. It can lead to uh, confusion. It could lead to potentially conflicting decisions. And then you're spending a lot of time trying, trying to resolve conflicts and um, things like that. And now has come this whole new, um, and this is just one of the new models that uh, people are talking about. And where does this model evolve called the holacracy model is essentially coming from um, what's making startups successful. So if you think of a startup and you think about what makes them either successful uh, or relatively agile is the fact that people who come together to run that as an organization are people who are really interested in that particular problem. They are willing to do whatever it takes independent of the role that they have been assigned in that particular unit. And then startups are relatively very good at actually going across multiple ecosystems to try and symbiotically engage and energize with other startups and create relationships that can actually enhance the value proposition of each of them. So independent of them, there are these various circular models. So what this does is, if we kind of look at it and embed such a structure in an organization, it would mean that you have totally delayed. That means there are no layers in an organization. There is no formal reporting relationship. Uh, teams are based around specific tasks or activities that they are required to perform. Our roles are relatively driven by the need of the outcome rather than by the need of a particular uh, function or a particular um, um, department very high autonomy of execution, um, very high empowerment of workers. But um, if you think of this in any traditional organization, you will realize that this is going to be really hard to deploy because a lot of it uh, depends on the goodwill of the workers. And because we are used to a structured kind of an organization, um, there are no explicit mechanisms for setting up enterprise level or strategic objectives, at least um, none that we are aware of. So kind of what are we talking about when if we are talking about a very radical shift from traditional hierarchy to what we are now calling distributed authority. Um, Let it, this is Nilesh, just one question here on the earlier slide. Uh, how does the KPI evolve in these three structures now? What are the new KPIs for this holocracy model and how is it different from the other two? So the new KPIs are and this whole thing is based on out. So the way uh, this evolves uh, and I, I can kind of, um, I'll be sharing a little more detail in the subsequent slides. Um, the, the whole task is assigned as an outcome for a closed group of people. That means these are the five things that we need to achieve. And then the team determines what is the role of each and every individual and what is the expectation. And this is done in the form of rap rapid iterations. That means if you think of it like a sprint, then every day in the morning or every week, whenever the sprint is run, um, there's a clear task assigned to a team member and that team measure is, uh, member is measured in the following week on that particular task. And the team as whole is measured on an outcome. But you can imagine from the way I'm sharing right now, it's quite complex to execute such a model in a structured organization, particularly when as an organization, you're trying to look at an investor at the highest level and trying to say that I need to create a predictability of revenue and a predictability of outcome. And I'm trying to then distribute that predictability across departments the way I'm traditionally doing. So there's a complexity in that and we'll talk about it in a bit. But let's first talk about the, com the challenge. Does that answer your question, by the way, before I go to the next step? Uh, it does not answer, but I understand the point of view. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I will. I will. Um, Lalit, I will Lalit, try to I get some more. Lalit, Kalai. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. In this holocracy, basically, uh, is it that uh, people uh, driven by their own passion to join the group, or is it by virtue of their expertise, knowledge, you know, something like coming for a small project, come together and then deliver, go back. Is it a choice people make or is it the organizational process that allows this to happen? It's, a, it's both. So it's based on the interest and choice that individuals make. 
and um, it is also based on um, the expertise that they bring to the table. That means you need to be allowed to be a member of that group. The group must agree that they see value in your contribution and that you need to be included. In it. Um, I will be sharing with you the complexity um, and um, I, I totally agree with the fact that, you know, we will also examine how this is working in an organization. So you get a better idea of how this works. So we are, like I said, we are looking at a, a huge shift and um, so the question then comes as to how is this distributed authority working? And I think you've asked the question, what are some KPIs? How can we drive structure into an organization like this? How can we drive predictability? And that's essentially the, the feedback that we had that, you know, organizations that have actually tried uh, holacracy has actually not worked. And largely because like you correctly said, the KPIs that are being um, given, measured, very difficult to hold teams accountable, very difficult to measure how to predict results. And um, so these are some of the examples of organizations that actually tried and, and failed and um, moved away from the holacracy structure to um, hierarchical structure. So um, the learning then is, hey, you know, you just introduced us to a new idea, but now you're telling me that that new idea has failed. So what is the answer here? Why, what are we trying to really say in the context of this particular conversation? So what we are kind of trying to say, and I will, I will kind of, uh, is said in the following slides. Um, the first is that we all know that while um, traditionally we know that these models have not succeeded in the organizations that, where, which have tried it, um, the face of work is changing. Um, millennials who are coming in increasingly are coming in with an expectation that they are in an organization for achieving a certain positive social change. And the other uh, challenge we are facing is that uh, with, the, with the millennials also comes in this whole need for them to move from organization to organization at a more rapid pace, maybe the, either out of the need of that particular millennial or the need of the particular organization and market that's constantly evolving as well. Um, it's getting more and more difficult to get specialized experience. Um, and the other challenge, of course, is that employees are no longer responding as, uh, as they did to a traditional hierarchy or an heterarchical organization. The performance of organizations and individuals in that organization is not up to that standard. And, and on the other hand, like we said, there are these uh, um, holocratic kind of models which are basically seen in startups that seem to be working much better. So this is the kind of paradigm we are facing. And uh, what we are saying is that ultimately as organizations, if you have to make the teams rapidly responding to change, they need to remain engaged and they need to remain energized. So now we have a conflict. We have a conflict to say this new model doesn't work. And the reality is that the expectation of the people is that they want to make it work. So how do we resolve it? And this is, um, what is kind of um, becoming a kind of shift even in the way employees are currently being uh, looking at their jobs and roles. So all this is pointing to um, these kind of models, but evidence is showing that these models are not succeeding. So if we are to kind of look at the organization uh, of today, um, a large part of the organization structure is based around uh, how intellect, diligence and obedience and we are talking about now evolving to a, an organization which we are calling 2.0, which leverages passion, creativity, and initiative. And we know that our traditional models are not going to be able to deliver that. So here is the then takeaway. The takeaway here is that maybe the answer is not to have this holocratic structure as a structure where we are asking the whole organization to move into maybe what we can do is rather than actually evolve into a new structure, we can imbibe some of these processes and these processes we can then put into what we typically call powerful innovation teams or tiger teams and then create structures for these teams to succeed. So that is the kind of hypothesis that I'm sharing. And my hypothesis is very simple. There are some merits in this holocratic kind of structure. 
and we know that we can use probably some of these to create team processes that will support this organization 2.0 that we are talking about that will tap into the passion of people without tinkering too much with the current structure of the organization and how this actually works and how this actually plays uh, is is there in in the in the book that i've written uh, when change happens um, and maybe you know to take this uh, a little further um, and and i know kalai is on the call so maybe kalai i may ask you to to share your um, uh, your ideas in a in a minute when we were in bharat petroleum very traditional public sector kind of organization and we realized that we needed to drive change we created a team of people and this team of people were actually given more outcomes and though they were independent of the role that they had in the organization they were actually called internal coaches and each of them irrespective of the grade and salary that they drew uh, they were treated as equals and they were asked to drive a certain set of activities and drive the passion of certain of people to achieve a certain set of activities so that's the kind of principle that we are talking about in the context of um, this change so kalai you want to share some of your insights on how you think that worked yeah i think i agree with uh, <clears throat> um being a public sector i think we were used to a very traditional kind of organization multi layer and um, the change began with a team which has started as internal coaches i think uh, it was both symbolic as well as a cultural shift to dismantle uh, the label what is assigned in a traditional organization and uh, what we were communicating to the entire organization what matters ultimately is the passion your creativity and your ability to deliver and also create that momentum in the organization so it is only those people who are willing and participate in that kind of a movement uh, they came into uh, that team structure called internal coaching and they become the beacon of uh, building this culture through their own attitude passion and uh, they uh, became the symbols of change i think uh, it was a very conscious decision to dismantle that traditional organizational labels and the structure and then to communicate to the entire organization what we need to focus here on is the ability of the people to deliver and the passion i think that is how the roots of change started uh, in our company when the new structure of internal coaching was put in place okay thanks kalai so so let's kind of add some uh, some uh, structure to what all kalai gave us in feedback so if we kind of look at these new models uh, and we kind of look at what are the underlying principles of the new, these new uh, structures um, in the sociocracy type of structure uh, consent is driven by policy and decision making um, you know they've got some various uh, concepts of teams working in kind of circles and within these circles there are these teams that actually have one individual of team a for example connecting with somebody in team b and the roles that people take to achieve a particular outcome is by consent if we kind of look at the holocratic model the key goal uh, is to kind of create a team driven around a purpose uh, and organize and based on you know explicit rules so you know there's not kpi driven but rule driven that means these are specific objectives each individual is assigned and they are asked to deliver on those objectives somebody has a question sorry i i can't hear the question yeah can you please repeat yeah so sorry that's asked from me uh, as lalit or are you asking no i was asking the the person who had posed the question uh, i was also not able to hear him maybe it was it was not a, a question addressed to you all right yeah okay please please so continue. so um the the rules that these uh, teams um, with or the principles that we can pick up from a holocratic model is uh, creating what we typically call a uh, transparent accountability so what 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 we are saying here is let's take some of these principles that are there in these models and create team processes around that what that essentially means and what i'm trying to say is that 
when an organization is faced with a new idea or a new business model that they haven't tested so far let's take the example of the company that i was mentioning in korea now this is a team of people who are now targeting a whole new business at a segment of customers that are 16 and above as against a traditional team of 24 and above so the idea here was that we created what we call a tiger team around that new project and this team though independent of the hierarchy that they had they actually were uh, created as a kind of a team uh, selected based on a they were they were very excited about this segment b they had some insight on that segment c they had some capabilities that would be needed for that new segment for example they were familiar with manufacturing or they were familiar with the chemicals that went into the product they were familiar with the marketing and these teams independent of the rest of the organization were created in the form of a no hierarchy structure so this team was now uh, told that you know there's no but independent of what you are in the organization you are now going to be working as somebody who's tasked to deliver a particular object very similar to that of a startup so there was no fixed role it was more about what let's all collectively get together to achieve what um this uh, what what is expected of this particular task and these teams when they worked on these new structures there was a point where we had um, various checkpoints and there was a point where this model started showing early signs of success that is when we started rescaling the teams back to a more formal structure once the business model started maturing so that's um, um, the, the kind of hypothesis or insight that I would like to share. And then how does it work? The, 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 how, how this works is that within an organization, the hypothesis is create what we are calling an innovation challenge. That means encourage the em employees in an organization. And in this particular case, what we did is we, we had a concept called destroy your business. So we encourage people to come in with ideas that they felt that they could actually if they implemented that idea would actually destroy or take away from the business that the organization was currently doing. So it's like we created an open innovation challenge. These ideas were then evolved uh, using a kind of a venture capital style evaluation to say, hey, it's a great idea, but are you really feasible? And they challenge them on their thought, their idea, their concept, their model. And uh, finally, what bubbled up. Yeah. So Lalit, I just want to uh, interrupt here. This is Valmi Kanathan. Um, if, what you said made sense. I think that uh, I'm not sure whether you have experienced this. And you made a uh, point that uh, the uh, this Tiger team could have the uh, mandate to also explore disrupting the ongoing business. Now, when your uh, target market is the same and your um, uh, your current business is significantly larger than the new business that you're trying to explore, wouldn't there be? And uh, if there is how do you manage the conflict between the ongoing business and their stakeholders and the Tiger team's uh, stakeholders? Who at the governance level uh, drives the moderation or uh, approval to dis disrupt or uh, you know, uh, the territorial management, etc.? I would really appreciate if you have any insights there. Thank you. Um, absolutely well said. So um, as you know, organizations are political in nature and the leaders who are part of the more mature business are probably making more of the money, right? Because this idea is just a kind of an upstart of an idea. But here is the argument that we did with um, the uh, CEO of the organization, saying that if you don't allow your teams to disrupt your current market, there will be another disruptor that is coming in and will do exactly the same thing. So it's more important for you to cannibalize your own organization than getting somebody else to do that. And in the process of this cannibalization, you're also actually impacting the market share of the other players in that, in that market. So in this particular story that I had shared with you, and there are many such examples, but I'm, since we are focused on one, otherwise we, it will become too diverse. Um, we, we, we have to build the business case for why this disruption is going to be done by this organization. And when these teams actually made this uh, VC style kind of presentation in the Sharks, then we had these business leaders who were running the traditional businesses be a part of that evaluation. And they were the ones who actually started asking the most difficult questions of these teams. And these teams had to respond and had to show them how uh, this model would work and how this would actually destroy their business. And 
ultimately since they were participation participating in the process of selection of the idea and also they were contributing by uh, providing the resources needed for these teams to actually drive that innovation we were able to gain um, some kind of um, i would say a sense of collaboration and a sense of cooperation from them but what you correctly said is not an easy journey it's uh, it's a task that most organizations are faced with and that's why this has to be a fairly senior level decision uh, when you are embedding these things in the organization so does that answer or uh, yeah i certainly uh, does answer my uh, my submission here is while you're uh, sharing these experiences it probably worthwhile sharing your uh, experience as to how conflicts are being managed by the leadership when you said uh, ceo's involvement because i think that is extremely critical if this is ceo's uh, mandate if this is a ceo's challenge uh, 90% of ceo's time should be or i probably put in an extreme 80% maybe on how to make this uh, successful for the organization because 90% uh, of the business or 95% of the business or revenue comes from the traditional business and he should not get distracted in supporting the 95% of uh, you know business as usual and compromising on something new that everybody is willing to uh, you know uh, put their uh, passion and effort towards so i have seen uh, ceos kind of falling back into the traditional uh, business and their revenue because the business risk there um, is too critical for uh, the ceo survival and the business leaders who are not part of this tiger team will make a big issue to make sure the ceo's uh, bandwidth is choked for a tiger team's success so this is my experience so if you have any um, uh, insights as to how ceos and governance has been modified or uh, you know brought about to make sure such things are addressed appropriately thanks yes i will i will um, so in addition to that i will also um, add to to the complexity is um, the fact that ultimately organizations are all about success and uh, in ideas like these there is a high probability that these models are going to fail so how do we budget for that failure so the way we actually managed this whole structure was the ceo never involved himself or herself in the operation of that venture uh, of that venture what we did is we created a budget that was set aside for this new innovation and that was being governed by this team of what we are calling now venture capitalists so they were given a budget and they were told to invest that budget in these new ideas uh, maybe one or two of them give them enough seed funding to be enable in enabling them to mature that particular idea and then the role of these uh, vcs was to kind of constantly look at certain milestone and release budgets and funding to them as that matured so from the ceo perspective his time was not involved uh, in doing that so for example i can even share my own personal example where within sap uh, we've developed a whole new line of products which um, was a new innovation that i developed uh, we have uh, what we call sap ventures and these ventures uh, have been given a budget and they have now given us about 1.5 million euros to fund this innovation and they are monitoring that and measuring that and every time they're giving us certain kpis and once we call it cross that quality gate we get additional funding so in this particular case the ceo doesn't get involved in the day to day of making this innovation succeed but is getting a constant feedback just like he or she gets of any other business on how this innovation is tracking over time out of the five uh, innovations that we have uh, four of them are kind of they stop funding because they're not achieving the milestone one of them is still continuing and has now got funded up to 10 million because it's kind of matured into a product so you're actually allowing for these to evolve you have to set aside a budget for this particular innovation and you need to make sure there are some checks and balances that is done by the uh, um, sharks den team to make sure that the budgets are not you're not blowing up the entire budget uh, through failed innovation there are enough checks and balances to manage your costs and risks does that make sense oh yes absolutely makes sense i i don't want to hijack uh, this team but my one, uh, last submission i don't think i want you to uh, you know uh, spend time on this but uh, i have seen challenges where your common resources are also being consumed by the tiger team the specific team like the uh, go to market or uh, you know uh, when you are a hr or a strategy team these are the common um, resources if they 
uh, if they're going to be common to the main business as well as the tiger team, how do they prioritize? Because the priority will always be for what is feeding everybody on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, CEOs mandated to deliver the results and the tiger team starts saying, you know what, I'm going to disrupt this uh, portion of your revenue from this customer and hence I need to converse with the customer. The conflict is in the customer uh, location between the traditional team and the tiger team for that particular business solution. The traditional business would say, this is my solution, which is, let's say, $100 million. The Tiger team would say, you know what, I will transform this business, but you gave me $50 million. So one is losing out, the other one is uh, gaining. So this would be a priority that uh, the management or the CEO or at the board level need to decide as to how to handle this, because the stakeholders, the end stakeholders are the same, but the uh, you know, uh, internal structure, the way you uh, you said it, towards new or new business line, internal structure should be I wouldn't say accommodating, but tolerant, tolerant enough to, um, you know, if somebody loses uh, in favor of somebody's um, uh, winning, that is new winning is better than uh, uh, losing the old model. It needs to be appropriately compensated and everybody must be brought into the you know, success uh, celebration, so to speak. I just want to leave it at that. And I, I hear you. I hear what you have uh, said. And I have obviously had a very uh, interesting experience uh, in the transformations. I just wanted to know if there is a governor that has been, uh, um, you know, experienced on transforming one service line to a completely uh, radical uh, business model. So I, probably we can have this conversation offline. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah we, yeah, we can have it offline, but I'll just share with you uh, my experience. So what we had done when I talk about funding for this particular team, it's it's funding even the resources that are needed. So for example, if there is an HR person needed and, uh, for that particular business or there's somebody from marketing needed, that marketing person's salary or, or cost is charged to that particular investment. So the team that's sitting on that, creating that innovation buys that time of that person. So, so to that extent, you know, it ensures that the team remains based on purpose, based on the need, based on the outcome. And you're not pulling in resources uh, on an honorary basis without recompensating the organization or without taking away that person's role. So it allows for people to be pulled out, put into this team as a part of the cost center and drive that innovation to a certain point and then pulled out going back to their uh, regular roles when the teams that are currently in that innovation don't need them anymore. So that's how we manage it. Sure, sure. I, I think we can have this conversation offline. I don't want to hijack. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, Lalit, uh, hi, this is Suresh. Uh, we are uh, only five minutes away from the uh, suggested uh, uh, stop for the session. Um, so I was wondering uh, how should we take it uh, on from here onwards? Uh, would you like to uh, kind of wrap it up and then we quickly uh, move to a, uh, the, uh, we open up the room for the Q&A uh, for another uh, five to seven minutes. Yes, so what I will do is I'm actually kind of um, moving to answering those questions that we had earlier been asking. So let me complete that one slide and then we can uh, okay. probably go to the question and answer. Sure. So uh, just a kind of summary. So what are we saying? We are saying that for mature and scalable business models, uh, it's good to have the hierarchical structure. For the ones that are kind of evolving, probably the heterarchical structure um, has some advantages. You can actually create better processes, better product and better service. And for the immature business models, the ones which are new disruptive ideas, what we are recommending is uh, that you should have some kind of a hierarchical structure. While it's very bad, uh, and like you said, it's disruptive to functionals and processes, but it is good when you're kind of creating new service offerings and you're trying to create new project value. So that's what I kind of need, uh, wanted to leave some thoughts in terms of uh, uh, with, with this group in terms of how uh, as organizations we can kind of create a multiple set of structures uh, but embedding some of these uh, new structures into new teams to drive the new innovations. So uh, I think the question, uh, the last question was around how do we manage then once these have matured, how do we bring them back into an organization? And, and we're saying that, you know, when you're embedding a new business model into an organization, there are some key components you need to have. 
The first is once they have in, they have integrated, we need to be very careful when we are putting them back into the organization. Whatever parts are working, we need to kind of make sure that those structures and processes are, are retained and, and remain. Otherwise, it will become pretty much the same old organization in the past. We need to create reward mechanisms that will reward the integration. Exactly the point made that you know if people don't feel rewarded or compensated to adopt a new idea and the new model, uh, there's a low probability that it will be adopted by the rest of the organization. Um, we need to then also make sure that the right KPIs are put in place to, to, uh, to drive this kind of adoption. Um, and of course, um, and I think that's uh, what has been pointed out here as well, um, there is a lot of politics and there is a whole lot of work that needs to be done to manage the politics of the change that is needed. And finally, uh, we need to make sure that this new model that we are adopting, uh, while it retains all its essential components, is then fitted seamlessly back. Um, and, and therefore, the change impact is very carefully assessed uh, before you bring this model back into your traditional business. So that's the kind of uh, all I had to share. Um, thank you so much for listening and thank you for your questions and happy to take any more. Thank you very much, Dalit. Uh, so uh, the room is now open. Thank you. Unless you care for the company. When you care, see, Abhi, I'm telling you. I have good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think that was a side conversation. So any any questions? Uh, Lalit, I have a question. Uh, I guess I can probably go ahead or a or a comment. Uh, what was interesting was uh, the point that you made about the different uh, structures and organizational models and uh, the, uh, the for the organization to switch from one to the other depending on the maturity stage. You said the hierarchy, heterarchy, holacracy and sociocracy. Uh, the organization can move from one to the other. The question I have is how easy is it to move from one to the other? Because uh, you know we're talking about an organization and not a not a team. What is your experience? So, the experience uh, typically uh, I can give you a theoretical answer and a practical one. The, I'll rather focus on the practical one. So, in the practical one, you have to imagine you have a bunch of people who have been working on a totally new idea in a totally new way. Getting these people to integrate back into um, their the organization is the more difficult process. Embedding the new innovation. So, for example, again continuing with the same example that we have, where we were starting to target the 16-year-old, that strategy, that marketing plan, the uh, logistics part of actually getting the new suppliers into the into the uh, business. And the ability to deliver that, creating the new marketing campaigns targeted at the 16-year-old was the easy part. That was the one which, you know, from an organization structure point of view, can very easily fit back into your supply chain and your operational structure and your, uh, and your marketing uh, strategy. What doesn't fit is this team themselves. Because now they were suddenly, they are now subset of a larger organization. And they are now subject to the same rules of governance and policies and processes that uh, is being done by a traditional organization. So managing the expectations of these team members and managing and making sure that you retain the energy that they have, to my mind, is the most complex one. Mm -hmm. There's no easy answer. Uh, there, are, uh, there are obviously ways by which you can give them some kind of... Um, incentive uh, for buying back their startup, if I may put it that way, like an incentive. There are ways by which you can create some interesting roles as mentors to make the entire adoption flow seamlessly into the organization. Um, but there is no one single answer I'm unfortunately able to share. Sure, sure. So this is uh, Thank you. Hi, Dinesh here. Can I chip in? Yes, please. All right. In one of the large organizations that I have experience of working in, uh, they had multiple structures for uh, multiple purposes and every single time they created a virtual boundary around the new initiative and isolated it from the traditional organization. 
And this was done at fairly large levels, not only in innovation terms, but also in terms of the kind of segments that the organizational products were targeting at. So the mass products were treated differently from the premium products and both uh, uh, had virtual boundaries around them. And how did that work for you? Uh, it worked beautifully till the time that the, the, the new part of the business matured enough uh, and then they were integrated and the process took about six years. Yes. Yes. Um, absolutely. Well said. So, so like I said, the process of reintegrating them back is not as easy as the slides make them out to be. Um, they are complex and um, a lot of work needs to be done in the context of managing that change and uh, largely will depend on the context and the situation. If that's, I know it's a very consulting answer, but that's the reality. <laughs> <laughs> so Dinesh, I have a question for you. Again, I'm uh, hijacking Valmika Nath. Um, yeah. You talked about uh, two separate uh, virtual organizations. Did they have a common go-to market for the common customers? Yes. Uh, in okay. fact, if you look at it is that they would, and, and uh, I have no qualm in saying, naming the organization, which is HUL. Mm -hmm. They not only had a common customer buying from the common uh, common outlet, retail outlet. Okay. The way you would sell into the outlet was very different. Oh, okay. And not only one, there were five different people who were selling the same company's products at mm -hmm. different terms. Uh, and the even the remuneration structure of the people who were uh, venturing into these organizations was very different, including oh, okay. the, the variable part. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, um, was the uh, new the new organization, new virtual organization, uh, providing uh, solutions or products which was in competition with the traditional business? Some cases, yes. Some cases, okay, because that's where I see normal problems in terms of people uh, managing their territories and in their authority because they contribute immensely. The traditional business contribute immensely to the traditional business volume. So they have a bigger say in the matters of running the organization compared to smaller one who will be disrupting them. So I've seen politics there. And if uh, senior uh, executive CEOs don't chip in to bring everybody on board, it becomes a serious challenge. That's my experience. That's why I asked. Classically, I'll give you an example which is not relevant now, but then in okay. good old days, Lux mm -hmm. would compete with the Little. And, oh, okay. and the two uh, brands would compete for the marketing buck from the same uh, vice president marketing. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but the good news, uh, and, and that's been my experience, and this is where I would like to share my insight, is that what we are saying, the resistance that you are talking about is true in many mm -hmm. organizations. Mm -hmm. But what I've increasingly found is a lot of people are open to this. You know why? Because when they come to us, they are saying, hey, we are getting disrupted. And, you know, we don't know where the next attack is going to come from. And we said, okay, we will simulate the attack for you from your own employees. And that's when suddenly they realize this is actually the way forward. Because unless they are able to do that, they are also realizing that they are going to be disrupted by somebody other than them. So I'm finding, in fact, a lot more people open to this disruption uh, than I would say about few, four years ago or three years ago when we actually started this concept. Okay, good. Because my experience has been um, almost seven or eight years uh, back when traditional business and new business were in conflict. Naturally, people have to be bought on board and commun the communication is absolutely critical from the top leadership to the tier one leadership to ensure uh, everybody's empowered. It's better to be uh, you know, uh, threatened by an internal uh, partner than an external competition because uh, you know, the learnings and uh, 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 adopting new things are so much easier if it, the learnings are within the organization. I completely agree with you on that topic. But it's about leadership and how they manage this transition. That fundamentally uh, makes success or a failure of this uh, transformation. Uh, Lalit, uh, I'm sorry to be the timekeeper, but uh, I think we are now uh, past the... <laughs> Thanks. I know it's, it's hard, but... Uh, I, I, yes, we will have to wrap up the session now. Uh, so uh, just to sum it up, uh, lots of insights uh, and also a lot of learning. Uh, for me particularly, I, I picked up quite a few things. I'm sure the, the other participants did as well. Uh, so on, on behalf of uh, all the participants, uh, 
uh, on behalf of uh, Leadership Accelerator and uh, Coach Compass. Uh, really thank you for a very enriching session. Uh, we all struggle with change and more so when you are uh, leading the change initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lalit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank thanks, Lalit. Thank you very I'm much. I'm signing off. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.